Richard and Judy recommending great books for you, exclusive to WH Smith. Dear Thing, when I was a little girl, I had a book called How Babies Are Made. It was beautifully illustrated with photographs of paper cutouts of the womb, the fallopian tubes, the sperm. The illustrations were so exquisite and careful that the sperm even had shadows. Digging deeper on the download with WH Smith. The book started with a hen and a cockerel, and in the following pages the egg was laid and the chick was hatched. Then it showed two dogs mating and some puppies being born. Finally, it showed a man and a woman lying in bed together under a flowery blanket. They were smiling and holding each other. You weren't conceived that way. How far would you go to help your friends? If they were childless and you could give them a baby, would you? Well, that's the central topic of Dear Thing by Julie Cohen, and we're reading that next on the Richard and Judy Book Club podcast, exclusive to WH Smith. At some point, all of us want to know where we came from. But I've come to realise that when we ask about our origins, we're not really asking about the egg and the sperm, the cutouts and the shadows. We're asking about the stories, how our mother and father met, why they loved. Stories count more than cells and DNA. Dear Thing by Julie Cohen Well, Claire and Ben are married and have been married for a while and they've always wanted to have children. They're deeply in love, um, but they can't. And they've gone through IVF treatment after IVF treatment and they finally decide, well, Claire finally decides that she's had enough. Um, but their Ben's best friend, Romilly, who's a single mother, volunteers to be a surrogate mother for them and using traditional sur surrogacy where she uses her eggs and they use Ben's sperm. Um, and so she gets pregnant. Artificial insemination. Artificial insemination, yeah, yeah with a turkey baster. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, not too graphic in the novel. And um, she gets pregnant with Ben's baby, who she calls Thing. Well, they all call it the, ba <laughs> the baby Thing um, because they don't know whether it's a boy or a girl. And being pregnant with Ben's baby brings up all these emotions that she has. In Romilly. In Romilly. Mm. For Ben. Mm. And she's secretly in love with him. She's secretly been in love with him since the day she saw him. Yeah. Mm. But she's been his best friend um, mm. and not said a word. And also for the baby. So she, she's not prepared for the emotions that being pregnant with Ben's baby is going to bring up in her. Right. Right. And of course, uh, neither is Claire prepared for the uh, emotions which Romilly's pregnancy with her husband's baby um, is going to bring up in Claire and what it means for their, for their marriage. I always think that infertility is, 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 is a... It's a wonderful subject for emotional and psychological exploration. Why, why did you decide? Why, why did you decide to sort of settle in on this particular aspect? Mm, well, it's very personal. Mm. Um, when I was, when my husband and I were trying for a baby, um, we I had three miscarriages, mm. um, one after the other, in the space of a year. Uh, early um, on, or early on, on yeah, yeah, early on. Um, the last one was on Christmas Day, oh, okay. um, and it was. And how far, how, how far advanced was the pregnancy? That one, I was only about ten weeks along. Okay. Um, but it was, it was, well, it was awful, and it was really devastating for me, um, and it wasn't talked about. Mm. <laughs> um, people just didn't talk about it. Or then, when you did talk about it, people said, "Oh, well, you know, it happens to everybody. It's so common, mm. you know." Which aren't is true. You, aren't, it's very true. But they yes. would say, "Aren't you over that yet?" Yeah. Mm. Mm. And I found it was devastating, and I was so sad. And at the same time, my best friend was going through infertility as well. She just couldn't get pregnant. Mm. And we just talked about it a lot. And it seemed to affect so many women mm -hmm. that I knew. Well, interestingly, that story you've just told would, would reveal why the book is so powerful emotionally. It's, it's, it's very real. Um, you you. It doesn't feel at all manufactured. And Judy cleared me to write about this in our review of your book, which we've done for the website. And Judy was more than happy for me to refer to the fact that, that you lost a, a child at 16 weeks. Um, yes, our, our, our first. Not my first child, because I'd had twins from my previous marriage, mm. but our first child. Yeah. So um, we've had that experience too. And as a man, um, I was unprepared, really, for the massive massive emotional impact that it has. I remember two or three days after, you had a very difficult process, uh, finally leading to the, to, the, to the baby being born dead. Um, and we went to France together, and everywhere we went, there were babies. Yeah. Did you find that? Yes, everywhere. everywhere. you look after these events, there yes. are babies. There are babies, and all my friends were falling pregnant. The mm -hmm. first time Sorry. I got pregnant, um, one of my best friends, two of my best friends were pregnant at the same time. Yeah. I called them up, I'm going to have a baby in November, I'm going to have a baby in November. One of them ended up having triplets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't see them. 
No. These babies were in the ICU unit because they were born early. I yeah. couldn't see them because I couldn't see any babies that were supposed to be born on the same day. Course, I, rem course, I remember course. that. I remember that vividly. And, and, and the, the looking back, it seems extraordinary, the depth of emotion it, uh, it invites. But, uh, but of course it does. It, it, it does. really does. Um, were you successful in the end, by the way? Yes, I have a little boy. Excellent. Yes, okay. yeah. But you... What you lose is you're not just losing this baby that you're in love with, but you're losing that whole future you've planned mm. for that baby. That yeah. whole you're mourning all of that, and you don't know whether you're going to be able to have a baby That's as well. That's it. That's absolutely just like Claire. I mean, basically, it's not just the hope you've invested in this particular pregnant early pregnancy. When you lose it, you think, well, is that it? I mean, yeah. am I destined never to have mm -hmm. uh, a baby? Um, and even though I had twins already, even I thought that, didn't I? Yes, you did. Just, yes, just, yes. Just, yeah, deep insecurity. But let's get let's get back to, to the book. Um, why did you, or when did the idea occur to you to actually introduce this extra dimension that Romilly is actually secretly in love with Ben? Because that's really what kicks the book. You know, yes. It really, really makes it work. Well, she had to be. Hmm. I mean, being a novelist is all about conflict, isn't yeah. it? Yes. And that is how you produce conflict. Yes. If she were in a happy marriage and a happy, um, you know, had a man that she was in love with, then this story wouldn't have happened. Hmm. And when I did my research for surrogacy, I know that in most cases it turns out wonderfully. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful gift to give another woman, mm -hmm. another couple. But in this case, there had to be a problem. And so mm. there had to be the love triangle. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's a perfectly written story, I have to say. Okay. The, the, the narrative works really well. Do you write instinctively or do you work everything out in advance and then write to the template? How do you do it? <laughs> Usually I write instinctively yeah. and I try to go on a journey with the characters. <clears throat> with this particular book, because the ending was so crucial, mm -hmm. I really had to plan it out. Yeah. Yeah. I needed to know who ended up with the baby right from the beginning. Right. And I needed to structure the story in such a way that that could be satisfying. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so with this one, I needed to know everything that happened. <laughs> when I asked you, um, uh, wrote the questions for you, which you answer at the back of, uh, of the WH Smith book, um, I said, I found that Claire, at the beginning of the book, when everything, she seemed so perfect and wonderful, mm. beautiful, well off, you know, gorgeous husband, very happy marriage, etc. And I, 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 I confess that I found her at the beginning a bit irritating mm. because she is so perfect. In fact, you know, the process of her infertility um, destroys all that and you feel desperately sorry for her. But then you quite tartly replied to me that actually you thought she was, you never thought she was perfect. No, mm -hmm. she's, she's <clears throat> deeply flawed and she mm. wants to be perfect and she's not. And mm. so much of her conflict and journey throughout the book is being able to accept herself as flawed, mm. as somebody who is jealous, mm -hmm. who is who can't have a baby, you mm. know, who has this body who's let her down. Mm. And there's a moment at the end where she does come to accept that, that, mm. that it's, it's okay. It's okay to be yourself yeah. and not strive for perfection all the time. Oh. But yeah, she is a bit irritating. I at agree. The beginning. <laughs> well, at the beginning, because she just seems, which is perfect, you know, it's the way you structured the book and, and, and very well, but she seems to have it all at the beginning, although, of course, you soon realise that she certainly doesn't. Um, I'm quite intrigued by you because you're, you're American, obviously. Yes. Uh, but you now live in England. Yes. You came over here to study um, research fairies in Victorian children's literature. Yes, yeah. Is that true? It is true, yes. I was doing a PhD in fairies in Victorian children's literature. Oh. Um, I was a huge, I am a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. Oh, yeah. And do you know the um, fairy photographs? Yes, the cutting yes, yes, of fairy the photographs. The garden, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I started researching that and yeah. the images they portrayed of children in um, mm. late Victorian, early Edwardian times. Of course, we look at those pictures today and we think, how could the Victorians have believed that these were actual pictures of fairies? They're so obviously yeah. cotted up fakes. Well, why do you think that was? Was it because photography was in its infancy back then? It was this sort of perfect storm. So photography was in its infancy. These were young women doing this. And the image of young women at that time was pure, innocent yeah. and pristine. So you had to believe them. You had to believe them. Mm -hmm. Now, as a matter of fact, one of them actually worked as a photographer's assistant mm -hmm. and she was 16 mm -hmm. or 17 but they were um, portrayed as young children. And it was also post-World War I when so many people wanted to believe in the supernatural. Mm. Um, and Arthur Conan Doyle had lost his son, That's hadn't right. he, in the war, and he was desperate for anything paranormal to exist. Mm. Yeah. So all of that together, mm. 
made him very easily fooled. The man who wrote Sherlock Holmes. Yes, I know, I know, I know. He always thought he'd, he determined to come back after he died. Yeah. And he would, he would reappear at a seance and sadly he never did. Yeah. <laughs> Surprisingly he never did, too. <laughs> anyway, uh, to, Julie, to, thank you very much thank indeed. You I was so going much. to say, just to sort of uh, finish how we started, it's, uh, it's Dear Thing, it's uh, written by Julie Cohn, it's a fabulous story. Uh, and uh, if you get it from WH Smith, you get all this extra content, the Q&A and everything in the back. So enjoy that you came into being during one spring afternoon in a theme park inspired by children's building blocks. They're quite interesting, these blocks. They're manufactured in plastic with interlocking parts, and each of them can be combined with any others in an infinite number of ways. You could start with a single block, add another and another and some more, and end up with an elephant or a spaceship, a castle, a nuclear missile, a garden of flowers. In that one block, lies an entire universe of possibility. Nothing about it is predetermined or inevitable. The final form that block will take depends on the combinations that are made, the fortunate mistakes, the leaps of imagination, the environment and chance. It will become something more than itself. You were conceived when three people came together and agreed to try to make you. We didn't know what we were letting ourselves in for, but I think it's important for you to know that it was a beautiful day and that everything we did, we did because of love. All the other things were just technicalities. Yeah, I think this is, um, I think it's a really uh, interesting summer read. It will appeal to a great many women and, 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 and fathers too, um, because the whole subject of infertility, of desperately, desperately trying again and again and again to get pregnant and failing all the time and going through IVF and doing mm. all of that and it's still failing, is so emotionally fraught. And that's what this book's about. And also the emotional journey of being pregnant, just being pregnant and the way it affects um, the way a woman thinks, the way she feels, her emotions. I mean, women change when, when, when they become pregnant. And, and the character here certainly does. And everything that everybody expected was going to happen and predicted was going to happen doesn't. Everything changes. It's all... I think that women, when they're in that kind of grip of the desire to have a baby, mm. uh, I hesitate to say they become almost irrational because it sounds sort of sexist, but I don't mean it like that because I've been there myself. And it's kind of like... Um, it's overwhelming. It, it's obsessive. You can't think about anything Absolutely. else. And one of the central characters in this novel, Claire, who is very fortunate in so many ways. She's beautiful, she has a lovely marriage, she loves her husband, they're very well off, they've got a beautiful house, etc., etc. The one thing she can't have is a baby. Mm. She, that eludes her, she cannot get pregnant. And it means that her whole idea of herself um, takes a huge dive, her, her self-esteem plummets, and uh, everything, well, it virtually wrecks her marriage. But also for her to see her friend, their friend, her husband's best friend, slowly becoming more and more pregnant, more apparently pregnant. I mean, that does things to her, things that she wasn't expecting. Yes, because Romilly, who is uh, an unmarried mother, who is Ben's best and oldest friend, uh, volunteers when it, uh, you know, yet again, Claire fails to get pregnant through IVF. Um, Romilly vom volunteers to be a surrogate mother. Hmm. She's already got one child, so she knows she can do it. And she does. She becomes pregnant, artificial insemination with Ben's baby, which initially is sort of seen to be the perfect solution. Yep. But it's not, because pregnancy makes you so emotional, uh, whether you're the, the mother who's having the baby or the mother who can't have the baby, who is having to accept this baby, hmm. which is not even genetically half hers, it's her husband's. Um, but the other, the other half is that of the best friend. And the emotional problems and inadequacies that that throws up is overwhelming. Well, it's very sensitively written and it's very powerfully written at the same time. And uh, I agree with you. I think it's a great summer read. Well, don't forget, if you get these books from WH Smith, you get all the extra content, which is exclusively in the back of those books in store. Or, of course, you can always uh, read them on an e-reader. You just download the free Kobo app. Just two more titles to tell you about in this season's selection. I feel like I go through my days collecting information, um, kind of thinking and watching and listening, and I don't know what I'd do with all that information if I didn't write. I'd be a sort of intellectual hoarder, I think. That's Lucy Whitehouse. Come back to find out more about her and her book before we met. It's a marriage thriller, something I've had first-hand knowledge of for many, many happy years. <laughs> oh, Richard, more than just a book club. Richard and Judy, 
exclusive to WH Smith.